Hi, and welcome to Workplace at the River, where we transform lives at the workplace. My name is Joel, and I'm part of the team at Workplace at the River, and I'd like to welcome you to our Thursday Biz Talk. We would like to go straight into our talk, but before we do that, I'd like to invite all of us to play a simple icebreaker. Today, we're going to be talking about sustainability. So sustainability means different things to many different people. So I'd like to hear all of you here what does sustainability mean to you? All right, uh, that's, that's the slide there. Uh, so go ahead and drop your thoughts, drop what you feel about it into the chat. Uh, if you're joining us via Zoom, drop your comments on the chat uh, and, and, and let us know what you think about sustainability. All right, if you're joining us via Facebook as well, Facebook Live, go ahead and drop the comments, uh, drop in the, in the comments to, to see uh, what does sustainability mean to you? All right. Yeah, and I'll read out some of your comments. All right. Thank you, Dan. Uh, uh, sustainability means long standing. Uh, David says sustainability means the future. Okay. Aha. Samkyong says. Sustainability means going green. Ability to maintain. Thanks, Esther. Um, yeah, I, I will go with as long as you're able to last long, you are sustainable. Yeah, that's what it means. Anybody else? Long term. That's true. Thank you, Shaleen. Um, yeah, I, I guess that is uh, one thing that is true. You're not here for the short term, but you're here for the long term. Yeah, the long run, right? All right. Uh, Claudia says, the ability to maintain and not living off the future generation. Wow, that's a, that's a very, very detailed answer. Thanks, Claudia. Yeah, maintain um, and, and not just maintain, but thrive, right? Uh, yeah, we want to thrive in this, in this uh, climate. Uh, yeah, I, I know many of us are struggling post MCO and even right now in the RMCO. Uh, but yeah, let's, let's be sustainable yeah, for the long haul. All right, thank you. Anybody else? Just, we just got a uh, little bit more time. So 
we'll get a couple more responses. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Fly high lasts long. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to uh, yeah, lose, lose steam, right? You don't want to run out of steam. You want to fly high uh, and stay there and, and last long, right? Yeah. All right. Thank you, Dan. Okay. Thank you all for your participation. Uh, yeah, those in, in Facebook, uh, continue to drop your comments, uh, drop your thoughts in as well. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll be glad to uh, yeah, uh, hear them as well. So uh, throughout this talk, feel free to uh, drop your comments in the, the uh, uh, chat box. Uh, encourage uh, us, the, the team here working at Workplace at the River, and you can also encourage the speaker for today. All right, uh, before I introduce the speaker, uh, let me just say that if you've got any questions, you can drop them at the link, uh, tiny.cc slash, slash askwater. So go ahead and ask your questions. If you've got a, a, a bit longer question, you can drop it in there. Otherwise, you can drop it in the chat, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, or you can drop it in uh, the Facebook Live uh, comments as, as uh, the, the show is going on. So go ahead and drop it there as well. All right. Um, uh, so, yeah, without further ado, I'd like to introduce the speaker for today. Uh, his name is Aaron Patel, uh, and he is the CEO of iHandal Energy. And he will be talking about the, a very interesting topic called sustainability in crisis. Aaron, uh, over to you. Go ahead. Uh, uh, thanks, Joel. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for taking time out of your evening to join me for this. When Joel first reached out, I was wondering what topic would be most useful for me uh, to share with you, what you could benefit from, and that my story of how I founded iHandal may already be something most of you are familiar with. I'll just do an overview for the benefit of those who may not already know, and then jump right into a topic I believe all of us could relate to. iHandal captures, recycles, and converts wasted energy generated by buildings and processes into useful energy that could otherwise then be used for a variety of other applications. Recycling is best understood in the traditional sense for physical waste you generate that can be reused for making new items like paper and plastic. Similarly at iHandal, we do this for the energy waste you generate, finding new uses for it. For example, the heat in a car park. Have you ever walked through a car park and realized just how hot it is? Or have you walked past the back of you know, some shop lots or a building and felt that warm burst of hot air from the aircon? Have you ever stopped to think just how much energy is being blown out into the environment? Here at iHandal, we have found a way to recycle all of that energy and put it to good use. And just for those wondering why the name iHandal, the I in iHandal actually stands for innovation and the Handal part stands for expert in Malay. It combines to form expert innovation it actually also serves us well in other markets because it reads as I handle energy, which is actually what we do. So back to the journey of founding I handle, my journey started back in 2007, so about 13 years now, uh, at the age of 15. I was a typical high school student in the 11th grade of high school. Yep. On the third day into the first semester, my dad suffered a stroke that disabled him. At that time, he had a fairly new trading business dealing with hot water. While juggling high school and running that trading business with my mom to make ends meet, I realized that I would need to put my university studies on hold to help at home and support my family. What I then did was use every opportunity in my final year of high school uh, while I was doing the IB program to explore different technologies that I could build on, that something that could gen actually finally generate income to pay off the bills that we had and something that would be more beneficial for my need to tinker with things instead of just trading. Using one of my final year projects in physics and chemistry, uh, IB physics and IB chemistry, combined with uh, some of the knowledge I gained from reading books of Amazon, it became the foundation of what we do today, which revolves around heat engines and thermodynamics. So those in engineering most probably would have heard about that before. We have since grown over the past 13 years to support over 120 properties across nine countries in the region with the likes of Hilton, Marriott, Glen Eagles, and other established groups uh, in the area. Tune Hotels was our very first client who gave me a chance to actually test out what I had in mind when I was only 16. 
And since then, we have grown organically through referrals alone. Of course, not without challenges and trials along the way, but that's for another talk. The impact of our solutions deployed has seen a reduction nearing 200,000 tons of carbon dioxide emissions reduced annually, which is roughly the equivalent of more than 20 million ringgit in annual savings and taking off about 43,000 cars off the road. In the space of green technology, it is split into two core segments, which is renewable energy and energy efficiency. Renewable energy is what most people commonly refer to when they're talking about green tech, which is how we can generate energy cleaner, such as solar, wind. It doesn't tackle the problem if you're currently already wasting energy as you're just substituting your fuel source. You'd just be wasting a cleaner source of energy, which is still wasteful. What we focus on is tackling the waste that you generate instead. And it essentially is about doing more with less. Unfortunately, investment policy from the government and the general public have been focused on solar and other forms of renewable energy instead of creating a less wasteful culture that will work hand in hand with cleaner energy to hit environmental conservation targets. And the industry, which has been so over-reliant on subsidies and incentives from the government, and with mostly the government as the sole driver of demand, has created many concerns, especially with the current economic stress of financing various incentives already, as is, to restart the economy. Will this still be enough to continue supporting other green initiatives for the short to medium term? Only time will tell on that. The focus on energy efficiency came natural to me. Because as a value growing up, I was instilled with the idea of always being grateful for what I have, making the most of what is before me and not being wasteful. Some people just don't get that, and it's hard to instill that in them unless it affects them in a way they care about, which is from what I've seen in the past in my experience is most commonly their pockets. An example actually was a former team member of mine a few years ago that just couldn't understand why I was so particular about ensuring everything was switched off at the end of the day and not just put into standby when they left the office. That person misunderstood the intention as us being calculative and assumed we were worried over a few ringgit on the TNB bill, instead of the guiding principle of just not needlessly wasting if we could help so. When lockdowns hit, I believe many of us read and experienced firsthand of just how minimizing our movements, pollution and waste resulted in far cleaner air and just generally the surroundings. I remember reading post after post of how clean our rivers, like the Klang River was, due to reduced human activity in the area, just resulting in less trash being thrown in, and also industrial waste. In India, I think it was the state of Punjab, uh, there was an article that for the first time, I think in more than 30 years, the air cleared enough for the Himalayas to be visible again. Right? So imagine when the smog blocked out the mountain for 30 years, they couldn't see it. The question I've seen being asked around is, will this change last? or we will see a new focus on driving sustainability in this new normal that people refer to as we exit lockdown. Unfortunately, in my view at least, I don't believe we will see these effects last for the long term. As the issue, no matter how new and normal we believe we're entering into, habits and behaviors towards waste and the environment remain largely unchanged. An easy example is just how many masks have you seen strewn across the street in recent days, when we are speaking about hygiene being a key concern as we return to the workplaces. For many, until they received their TNB bill recently, <laughs> which showed a spike that hurt their pockets, I don't believe energy efficiency at home was a key concern. Nor will it be long term once all the subsidies kick in helping us offset all these impacts. Without being affected where it matters to them, would they see the need to change their ways? I don't personally think so. Sustainability has been turned into another buzzword in recent years. Many believe that it's a nice to have, that it will cost more to do something about the environment, and it's better left to larger companies and government instead. In the course of our business, we have come across two groups of people motivated to embark on these projects with us, like the ones that we do when we recycle energy. For the first group, it is most commonly just another KPI or target. It's a nice to have, or just another box to tick, that they're doing something about the environment, no matter if it's just for show or for a page in their annual report. The real drive is still the bottom line and sustainability is just an added burden to appeal to a certain consumer group 
of making the organization sound more considerate for internal marketing, right? Some people join companies just because they appear greener, right? <clears throat> for others and the group that I personally enjoy engaging with, it's a core focus and principle how they approach the entire operations, how the key people are incentivized and empowered to reduce their carbon footprint, and these are the clients we build long-term relationships with to journey with them. An example pre-MCO, we had a potential client that we could actually save about a million and a half ringgit a month and reduce about 26,000 tons of CO2, carbon dioxide emissions annually, just a single client with a single property in their group. Despite the sizable project, they shelved it despite the attractive financial and sustainable impact because it couldn't get past finance who said they would rather generate the equivalent revenue in a matter of days. And why should they be bothered with all the work in going through with such a project? With the current challenges, many businesses have in need of reducing the operating costs in view of reduced income. I think a lot of businesses are affected uh, revenue-wise. It is no longer a nice to have, but a need. We see this as an opportunity for the industry to engage with the first group of clients who can be driven by the economic benefits of sustainability in their operations to change now when it may have otherwise been neglected when times were better and the savings or costs were insignificant in comparison to the profits they made. We have also begun to engage a new group of customers that we had not targeted previously. We used to target MNCs, groups that were regional, uh, groups that were the top 10 of the industry, but now we've been targeting a very different size. As part of our give back to the community, we have been working with small business owners to help them get a handle on the utility costs. We have seen increasing interest with a diverse range of clients, all eager to cut their fixed costs, but not knowing even where to start. And that's where our team comes in. We're going to the extent of providing our solutions with no investments for these individuals so they can see immediate savings instead of burning them with another bill to pay for a system just to save money. And together as a community, we can actually grow and recover long term. Making full use of this immediate demand and interest in cutting back costs to convince the more challenging businesses, who are the larger emitter of emissions usually from my experience, and investing further in spreading awareness of what each person can contribute individually, even at home, right? Sitting at home, there's even things you can do, will be how I see us contributing towards creating a better environment. When MCO first hit, at least, for me at least, I didn't realize the depth of the impact COVID would have to our industry and our business. Our teams were spread out across the region in the middle of projects, and within 48 hours, we had to pull all of them back or risk them being locked out of Malaysia with no hope of returning until the lockdown ended. And these guys, some were new dads, and all they wanted to do was to get back. It was me trying, it was almost like a travel agency trying to get them back. It was just completely hectic where flights were being canceled one after another and we just had to find a way. And thankfully we managed to get most of them back day three or day four MCO. I thought it was something that would be over uh, in a couple of weeks until on day two of MCO when we had a group mentoring session with Endeavor where the mentor shared the real impact of COVID, sorry, of COVID that was coming and how we needed to better prepare ourselves and our businesses for the long road ahead. Before the MCO, our business has been growing annually. We've been doubling about every year, and it was all about growth. But instead of that, just in a matter of weeks, all of that growth was thrown out for the year, and it was all about survival now. We had projects about 90% completion overseas, and in our business, well, for, for, in our industry, we aren't paid progressively but once the system actually goes live, when it's actually running. And pulling our team back so close when things are just at 90, 95% completion, where we've incurred all the costs, we've bought all the goods, we've incurred all the costs of flying them there to get things done, really stressed out cash flow. Gratefully, we are blessed to still receive orders during the MCO period, but the challenge was in fulfilling them. Burden with not being able to invoice clients since the work was completed only partially, contractually, and meeting the moral obligations of paying salaries, despite the inability of the team to work remotely, to build machines and deliver solutions. We had to get our entire team uh, on board, the locals and the foreigners, with partial deferred salaries. 
to ensure everyone is able to weather through this together as a company, even our foreign workers and with not a single person let go, in contrary to some of our peers. Exiting MCO, we have seen signs of recovery for our business and the industry in the past few weeks, especially in the past few weeks, but have not grown complacent that the threat of COVID is still real. But we only have bigger things to look forward to post COVID-19 and doing our best to take full use of this opportunity, despite the challenges of operating in such a difficult climate in bringing as many people and companies as possible to change their ways, no matter what is the motivation to become sustainable and be part of our movement in creating a carbon neutral Malaysia and beyond over the next decade. Over to you, Joel. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for that, uh, uh, Aaron. Yeah, uh, yeah, nice and short and sweet, uh, but definitely very, very meaningful. Uh, yeah, thanks for that. Uh, for those of you who've got questions, please drop them at the link uh, tiny.cc slash askwater. Uh, or you can drop them into the, the chat uh, box in, in Zoom. Or for those of you viewing via uh, Facebook Live, go ahead and drop the, the, the comments there as well. And uh, yeah, we'll be glad to answer uh, all your questions. So um, Aaron, there's, there's um, a bunch of questions coming in. Um, so maybe you can elaborate a bit more. Uh, you know, you talked about, uh, yeah, a little bit about uh, how you started I handle or I handle as you call it, right? Uh, and and um, yeah, you talked about the, the, the science experiment, the, the physics experiment that you did. Uh, so what was the, um, the major impetus that, that pushed you along the way? And what has been, uh, you, you know, these this things about, uh, yeah, turning off everything, um, uh, yeah, in, in, your, in your company. Uh, it's something I do at home. Uh, yeah, I, I literally go around the house and I make sure that plugs are turned off and, and uh, if it's not being used, I actually unplug it, uh, right? Because uh, I, I actually see the, the, the savings in terms of dollars and cents, right? Um, but uh, yeah, what has sustained you all these years uh, and, and uh, kept you going, you know? Uh, yeah. So initially when we first started, I think... Uh... So when my dad first felt it and up to, well, I think about five years in, I think it was purely survival, right? Uh, there was no plan A, plan B, plan C. There was only one way of getting through this and actually paying the bills, right? Uh, so I paid for my school fees, actually, the last two years of school fees through this business. Uh, I used uh, whatever we could to pay off medical bills. So there was no backup. So without any, uh, with any other, without any other uh, ways to exit, right, or find a backup plan, I had to make this work which is why all my effort was dedicated to just finding a way. If this didn't work, we found another way. And that's how we just ended up uh, with a product that worked. We had no excuses, right? Because we had nothing to fall back on. And I think it, I did become complacent. I think after a couple of years in, when life gets a bit more comfortable, right? I was figuring out actually what could drive me to the next level. Because if it's just about survival, once you reach a certain sense of comfort, that's it, right? And uh, you just want to do something else. And uh, it was actually through mentorship sessions. So my mentor was, uh, it was in the entrepreneurs organization in Malaysia where I joined in. We actually worked and figured out what was the larger impact of what we did, right? So it wasn't like a startup where I had a vision of making Malaysian carbon until the age of 15. And, you know, and it's guided me all this while, right? That, it, it wasn't that way, right? Uh, it was a transition where instead of us just going day in and day out of clock out uh, and just built machines that did this, we actually figured out what was the greater impact. And we realized that if we actually just covered all the industrial and all the hotels and everyone in the region with a system like ours, we could make an entire region carbon neutral, right? A movement just started by one company. We felt it was powerful and we ran with that. All right. All right. Thanks. Thanks for that, um, uh, Aaron. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. You, you stuck with the vision and yeah, you, you carried it through. Um, I just want to bring up, um, you, you mentioned... Uh, I think it was entrepreneur organization. I think it's called EO, right? And uh, in your talk, you talked about uh, this, this organization called uh, Endeavor. Uh, maybe you can talk about uh, what it, it's about, uh, how it's been helping you uh, uh, so far, and uh, as well as how does one uh, get into a mentoring group uh, or, or, you know, uh, uh, yeah, small group or, or support group such as that. Yeah, how, how do we go about that? Sure. So uh, for those who are entrepreneurs or running their own businesses, right, it's 
I mean, it's overly used, but it's lonely at the top, right? Because there's not really many that you can actually dialogue with or, or, or share the problems that you're having. Uh, so I came across EO uh, through some friends. So Entrepreneurs Organization is a global organization where it's a peer-to-peer -peer organization, meaning there's no hierarchy, right? You could be with a company that's 20 times your size and it's purely about learning from each other through experience. So nobody's gonna tell you how to solve your problem, right? But you share something in a, you share in a closed forum with eight to 10 other individuals. So it's segmented into forums uh, where there's no conflict or interest in business and you actually can share your challenges and they actually guide you through that. And there's also other programs like mentorship, right? So any business that's above a certain revenue can actually apply for that uh, to join in uh, for EO Malaysia. Uh, couple of years into EO, uh, I got called the uh, Rope in for Endeavor. So that's a peer-to-peer -peer organization. And it focuses not only on business, but it focuses on, uh, they call it EO360. It's about social, it's about life, it's about growing together as a community of entrepreneurs. Uh, Endeavor, on the other hand, is to select uh, what you call scale-up companies. So not quite startup, but companies that are really proven with a track record and just need a push to get to the next level and where they put their backing. So it goes through a nine to 12 month selection process uh, where you have to be selected to get joined to be part of Endeavor. And that's when you get access to mentors to actually guide us. So those are the two organizations that has been instrumental actually in our growth. Hmm. Thanks, thanks for that, um, uh, Aaron. Yeah, uh, yeah. so I guess uh, you need to have a track record in order to uh, yeah, be part of uh, something like Endeavor, right? So uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks for, for pointing that out. Um, yeah, we've got a question here from, from uh, Sam Kyung. Um, so, uh, yeah, if you, if, if you could, you know, quantify uh, uh, this, this whole cost uh, saving or sustainability venture, I mean, you, you brought up that, that example about how uh, one of these people in, in the finance uh, uh, turned down the whole project because uh, they could earn much more uh, you know, in, in the same amount of time or less time, right? So what is the cost of participating in this energy saving venture? Uh, so typically, you know, what are the cost of the, the, the products that you sell, uh, the services that you sell? Um, and, you know, even in this time, SMEs, they're really struggling. And, and you said you've, you've been focusing on them lately, right? So how, uh, how have, have you been going through with that? Uh, and how does it come to a point where, uh, you know, a, a company would say, yes, it, it is financially viable uh, or feasible for them. Yeah, how do you go about that? So uh, we realized that we don't do a product. So first of all, just to clarify, right? So we actually build the entire solution uh, out of how do you actually make use of the equipment, right? And uh, we don't sell machines anymore. We don't sell solutions. So the cost of participating in this is zero because we finance everything. So there's really no excuse not to do it. Right, uh, and it's, our, it's the core of our business model. You don't pay for something that you, so the, the biggest turn off is somebody tells you you can save money, but you need to pay first. It's like a Ponzi scheme, right? I will give you a return, but you gotta pay first. And that's the common way the industry works. And what we do is uh, you pay nothing, right? We put it for you, we put it in for you. If it works, it generates savings, which we would have known prior to deploying it, then we get a share of that. If it doesn't work, we get nothing. So we really removed all the excuses. So for someone even in finance, it's a no-brainer. And we transitioned to that. It took us some time because we require quite strong capital backing to be able to do that, right? If you want to do for a very wide customer base. I see. Okay. So if I understand correctly, it's a, it's a profit sharing type of thing. Uh, so yeah. uh, based on the savings that they... Okay, that's a, that's a good way to, to do it. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I think uh, it is... Uh, very different from what we, we experience. Yeah, it, it is true that uh, people uh, tend to ask to pay upfront first and then, and then, uh, yeah, then there's a retainer fee or something like that. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah, uh, I mean, thanks for really blowing our minds here. Uh, I, I think uh, it's, it's a way for us to rethink. Uh, this is not just uh, sustainable in terms of uh, the energy, but it's sustainable in terms of, of the financial, the dollars and cents, right? The ringgit and cents. Uh, because, uh, yeah, Finance, financiers will say, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not paying up anything up front. Uh, the results will speak for themselves and then, and then that goes to you. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. cool. Thanks, thanks for that. Um, uh, so I've got a, a question about this whole area of sustainability. So uh, this, this is from me. Uh, I used to be in a recycling type firm. And if you look at the, the, the financials, uh, 
actually it is quite expensive to to do all these recycling thing. Uh, uh, I mean, people always say go green, but actually it is expensive to go green, right? Uh, so, I mean, we used to get all these this, uh, chemicals in, uh, we used to have an, an incinerator, uh, it's time consuming, it, there's a lot of uh, finances uh, involved. So, um, how have you managed to, to stay uh, profitable? I mean, in, initially you said you, you, you sell the, the solution basically, but now, uh, you, you basically give them the consultation what to do. Yeah, how have you maintained uh, sustainability in terms of, of uh, finance so far? Sure. So a unique thing about our journey is we've been profitable from the very first year we operated, right? So back when it was 13 years ago when we started, uh, entrepreneurship wasn't as what it is now. There's, there's no like startup programs where people will give you funding for having a great idea when I started, right? Whereas now there's a lot more support. And because of that, our business had to be cash flow positive and it had to generate income. Uh, I think one of the differences is because we do turnkey and if you're just recycling physical products, most of them, you recycle the waste, you had to generate some raw material that you sell. And that's just raw material, right? We convert it into something that's of use, right? That is of high value that they can actually benefit from. And because of that, right, no matter what the cost of equipment is, because of the savings we generate in that end product that they can actually use back in their operations, the savings is significant. And that's when the paybacks are within two years plus. So normally anything that's below three years where you can recover your money is something that's very attractive to people and we've always kept it at that. And then because of us controlling the whole process, because from start to end of the entire thing, we, we actually manufacture. So back when we first started, I used to make machines out of the home, out of my home, my car porch. It's a typical story that in Malaysia, we don't have garages, so it's a car porch, right? And outside uh, in Banda Otama, I used to make machines there until we got kicked out by our neighbors. Right. Uh, then we moved to our own factory. Right. We used to we actually physically make our own machines. Uh, we manage the whole thing in house. We even operate. We maintain. We install everything with our own guys. And because we manage the whole process the A to Z, right, we have control of costs, and we actually make the whole venture highly profitable. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's so. There's no middleman. There is no outsourcing. There is no, uh, yeah, any of those. Right. Uh, so you could just go. Meet Aaron and his team uh, if, if you've got an a energy solution that you want to find uh, and then his team will find that solution for you. Yeah, so I, I guess that's, that's basically it. Wow, sounds so simple uh, and, and so uh, surreal, right? Um, yeah, but, but let's all learn something from this um, that, you know, you, you don't need to have so many middlemen. Uh, yeah, just a, a good idea implemented well. Uh, yeah, and you'll be like Aaron Patel. <laughs> It rhymes. Well, not my intention. Anyway, uh, so, uh, you, you know, uh, how you have just sh uh, shared your whole story uh, and, and how you started from that idea, you, you, you were doing it in the house, uh, everything is end-to-end -end with, with your team. Um, uh, how, do you, how do you educate business owners uh, in terms of sustainability? So, uh, I mean, for yourself, you've got a very clear business model, but I mean, if you were to advise uh, the business owners that are watching, that are viewing here, what are some of the things that you would, you would tell them uh, in order to be more sustainable, both financially and uh, in terms of our environment and going green? Yeah. Okay. So I think the business side is quite easy. So a lot of people forget businesses are to make money, to sustain themselves. Unfortunately, some businesses forget that, right? I mean, it's quite common these days. Uh, not to get uh, over caught up in the whole valuation game, which most probably has crashed now because of, you know, in this current period, to actually focus on building a business that has sound fundamentals, not just in the technology or the solution designing, but in the business model where you can actually generate income. And if that follows through and make sure it's not just being able to generate income, but to actually collect that cash. Some people can invoice, but they can't collect that money. So to make sure it's through the entire from start to finish, you can collect that cash, right? So that's on the business side. That's, I think, the most common thing that people forget, I think, in a lot of startups that come to, that we have uh, mentorship sessions with, and yeah, when they say they have such a cool idea, so how are you gonna make money from it? And they can't answer, right? We'll give it for free, so who's paying for it, you know? Uh, you gotta have the end goal in mind, because that's, it's not about, so I mean, it's great, it's the, not that would be a goal to, to be profit, I mean, to make huge bunch of money, you wanna solve a problem, but you need to have the profit to reinvest to grow your business, not just burn cash all the time, right? That's how you make a business sustainable. From an environmental point of view, uh, I think the biggest challenge is uh, with most people, it's 
if something has been this, done the same way for the last 15, 20 years, a lot of people are stubborn to change, right? Right. It's, you know, so when we work with a lot of buildings that are been passed on from one generation to another, when you meet the previous generation, especially, right, they'll say, it's been working since I started the, the building 40 years ago. Why do I want to go and change something that really works, right? They're very resistant to change. There's so many new technologies out there, right? And you need to try something out. If you don't try anything out, you're going to be left behind, right? Especially when in this period, when you can't maintain the energy costs, you'll see a lot of buildings are shutting down. Right. You need to be open to new ideas and new, new opportunities. All right. Yeah. So thank you, Aaron. Yeah, it, it is uh, being open. Yeah, yeah I, I, I like that. Um, and, and I guess this, this goes um, uh, across the board, right? Because uh, COVID-19, uh, this whole MCO situation is something that we've never uh, faced before. And, and uh, I, I would just quote your, your example just now where your energy uh, industry, uh, energy company had to go into a, a travel uh, agency, right? Uh, just to bring your, your, your employees back. So it's, it's a very different time uh, for all of us. Yeah, um, yeah uh, just further to that, um, you know, you shared about your story about how you have gone from uh, sustainability and, and doing well and, and being profitable from the the first year, uh, which is which is quite uh, quite something to say, uh, and then you went through surviving, uh, especially because of of uh, COVID nineteen and, and things like that, uh, and now, uh, basically, your business is restarting. I believe your clients are, are coming back, and uh, I mean, just talking to you, uh, uh, yeah, off the off the record, uh, yeah, you've been busy, uh, and I, I think you're you're taking time for us here, so that's great. So maybe what, what is your outlook for us uh, in the coming months? What's your outlook in terms of uh, uh, business in general? Uh, what what do, do things look like? Um, um, uh, yeah, specifically for your industry that you're in, in, in energy uh, uh, and sustainability, but also for the, the uh, economy in general. Yeah, how, how do things look like? I mean, it's all hinged on whether this fire, when we get a second or third wave, right? Uh, really, nobody knows until we really can get this out of the way completely, right? It's anyone's guess, right? We can recover and something happens again. It, it's, it's out the window again. So that's why, like I said, we have to be very mindful that no matter how positive we are, right? Uh, that things are improving, not to be complacent, uh, which is, I think, a, a good reminder our mentors have made. Because even as people are getting out of MCO, we're all very excited. We go back right, to life and businesses are happy. You know, things are moving again. It can, very, it can very quickly change if you have not adapted, right? So we have adapted, we have contingency plans. For example, if this does happen with another lockdown and we can't travel, because previously our business was, was all about reducing, right, being as lean as possible, right? Uh, our one team here traveled to all these nine countries to do whatever was needed. And now we have learned, we have to actually build teams in each of these nine countries so we can get things done even when lockdown happens again, right? So the outlook is great because again, whenever in our, in, in our industry especially, right? Whenever energy price, uh, well, energy is a problem for people, they want to cut down their costs, that's when they look for us. So in terms of number of inquiries, it's through the roof, right? It's back to back right now. Every day without rest, we get a new inquiry because everybody's just engrossed in, hey, my bill, even now with no business, I need to cut it down, help me, right? I even got some people, some aunties and uncles calling me, like, you know, for friends of my parents, like, hey, my electricity bill is through the roof. Can you come help me at this shop? So we've been doing like even like shops in malls and all that, which we have no experience in doing, but it's just a way for us to give back and help out. And along the way, we might find out a new opportunity or a new technology that might help out, right? So we've been very open to that. So in terms of economy, like I said, we really don't know, right? We're all very hopeful, right? We are very hopeful of it recovering, but you never know what might happen. So just to be mm. careful about that. Yeah, yeah, thanks for that. Um, actually, when you mentioned small shops, um, yeah, uh, yeah. Thanks, thanks for that. Yeah, I, I, I'm glad for your positivity. I'm glad for your your optimism. Uh, yeah, it's something that that uh, all of us should have. Uh, well, there's a lot of news about doom and gloom. Uh, I mean, the people I talk to, it's either they've got a pay cut, uh, business has lost income, uh, but you seem to have a very positive and and uh, optimistic outlook, and and I think that's great. That's very uh, encouraging, as well. Um, so you mentioned something about uh, helping out these, these people in their small shops, right, uh, in shopping malls. So uh, just, just a question in terms of your business, have you ever considered, uh, you know, going into uh, a residential or, or 
you know, a private owner's place. Uh, yeah, for example, like for me, I, I realized that like, um, uh, yeah, I, I step out of my, my bathroom after a hot shower, then, then I, I, I go uh, into an aircon room and then I realized, hey, there's actually hot air blowing on the other end, uh, which, which I could have, uh, you know, saved that, that cost. So, yeah, uh, how uh, would you think of venturing into the, the residential or private owner's uh, property market? Yeah. I mean, of course, uh, we do it for friends now. I mean, we do it on a case-by-case -case basis. The only reason is uh, it's all about, remember we, the question about sustainable business, we want to make sure we, we keep up our quality and also the service level. When you do a building, an entire building, let's say you have 500 rooms or 500 offices, you have one building and you have a single client, but in terms of the sale value or in terms of uh, the size, it's huge. When you, have, when you deal with individual homes, you're dealing with 500 different owners. So an example was a home that we did, right? We installed a machine on the ground floor and the guy kept on calling me because his dog, the nose, you know, the dog kept on hitting the button, the off switch, right? <laughs> you know, stuff like that you got to deal with. So it's about building the infrastructure that caters that. So we're definitely really, uh, interested in going for that. We just want to make sure that we have grown to a size that we can actually support, right? The last thing you want is when I have something in your home, it fails and it's going to take us a week to come by. So it's definitely in our roadmap, which we're working towards. And I think that's the only way for us to hit our goals. So, I mean, our goal is to hit 200 million tons of CO2 reduction, right? We're at 200,000. It's a long way for us to go. And the only way for us to do it is not only cover the big buildings or the big factories or whatever it is, is to actually get everyone involved, right? And that is actually a long-term target of getting everyone involved, to have this in each and every home. Okay, thanks, thanks, Erin. I, I find that the story about the dog quite uh, impressive. Yeah, uh, Sam Kyung says, eco-friendly dog. I think it's the, the reverse, right? It's turning off yeah, your, switches your, it device. Off. Yeah, yeah, switches your device, it. right? Yeah, okay. Um, maybe just, you've been giving us a, a, a bunch of numbers. So, uh, was it 200 million uh, tons of carbon? So, uh, just to contextualize it, like, um, I don't know, uh, how do you make a comparison? How much is really 200,000 uh, tons, uh, 200 million tons of uh, 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 carbon? Yeah. So, I mean, an example, we only use cars as a clear example, right? So 200,000, which is what we're at, is roughly about 40 or 50,000 vehicles off the road, right? So you're going to multiply that by how many folds to get to 200 million. So the projects alone in Malaysia won't get us there, but in terms of the amount that we do regionally, would actually help us to offset. So a Malaysian company launching projects regionally will actually help us offset the entire carbon emissions of Malaysia, which is roughly above 200 million tons of the Wow. Market. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for that. So, uh, uh, 400 cars is about 200,000, right? Did you say that? 40,000. 40,000, okay. There's about wow. 40 to 50,000 cars now, uh, equivalent of our impact, right? So okay. Just some quick math. Quick math, yeah, thank you, thank yeah. you. 100 yeah. times. <laughs> yeah. So it's about taking 5 million cars off the road. Wow, wow. That's, that is some significant uh, thing, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, so you, you know, you, uh, sorry, there's a question here. Um, so Aaron, you, you talked about how you uh, started this business at 16. I mean, I remember what I was doing at 16. I was trying to figure out at math, right? But, but uh, yeah, at 16, you were, you were uh, into this business. Um, uh, so how were you uh, managing between your school, your, your school schedule, uh, managing your business? And then uh, when you went to go and, uh, go and do your degree uh, and then, end up paying for your own degree the, the last two years. Um, uh, how did you uh, go through that? How did, how do you manage uh, yeah, in, in terms of managing your time and all that? So I, I don't have a degree. Uh, my highest qualification is high school. So my colleague always jokes when we have to submit CV, my highest qualification is a French award <laughs> that I have uh, honors in French uh, from, from my high school diploma. Um, so I mean, it came very natural to me. Uh, the reason is my dad uh, used to, he was a, it's a very small business that he used to do from home. So I used to hear everything he used to say and talk. So I remember like day, day one of getting involved back in the business when he fell ill, when I responded to emails, they thought he was replying because I basically absorbed the way he communicates. It was very second nature to me, right? And uh, like I said, I was all about survival. So right, of the family, uh, we had to do something about it. So a lot of it was from my mom and the support from her to actually get involved in this and to make it work, right? It was either that or going back to, and actually for two months, for some people that know, we actually lived off welfare from the church, right? So we actually went to the point of not even having any cash. So it's either doing this 
right? Or finding to, to leave school and actually figure out another way. Lah, right? Uh, so that was, that was uh, that. So how I managed was quite interesting, actually. Um, so I used to work and study at the same time for the two years in high school. So school was eight to three. And if you had a project in Penang, right? This is the high school, right? Uh, this was before I was in legal age drive, right? So it stays here, right? Unfortunately, I've been blessed with size, so people can't really tell, uh, right, what age I am. So uh, I used to work till, I mean, I used to study till three, and after that, I would drive straight away. So my first two projects was Kuhn Hotels, the one at LCCT, the old airport, and at Jalan Burma in Penang. So when we were doing the projects, I'll be working from eight, I mean, studying from eight to three, I'll be answering. So normally at the back of the class, it's where all the naughty kids uh, right where you're not paying attention or whatever so I was one of the, I mean I was working at the back of class with my laptop with my phone in the desk whatsapp I mean they didn't have whatsapp there was an sms or email uh, clients right in the desk and just getting work done right but teachers knew that as long as I passed all right they were very supportive they knew what the situation was so I was doing work in school my desk in school was my office essentially <laughs> and after after school if I needed to I would drive from 3 p.m. I leave school leave go to Penang supervise the project to make sure everything was going well and come back the next morning past midnight three four in the morning to go back to school the next day and i think we did that for about a year or two during uh, when i was managing studies and uh what do you call it studies and, and work and once that was all over i went full time so once i finished high school so that's like form six equivalent so i studied at moncara international so uh, it's american school right so form six equivalent ibs uh, like form six not even university uh, that's when we i couldn't go overseas to study i was meant to go to the state so i didn't do that and said, I just dedicated all my time and effort to this. Wow. Oh, that, that is truly an admirable story. Uh, incidentally, uh, Aaron, in case you, don't, you didn't know, I come from Penang. So when Tune Hotel was, was uh, just starting up, I think it was just before I left Penang. So yeah, uh, yeah if, if our paths had crossed, then things would be very interesting uh, indeed. Yeah. Uh, and, and to think that, yeah, you didn't, you, you couldn't drive, you were not the legal age, um, yeah, sorry, uh, but you were doing that, uh, and, and really, uh, uh, I, I really honor your, your tenacity, I really honor your, your hard work. The other part is to, to take care of your dad uh, in between uh, everything that, that's uh, been happening, right, um, and, and uh, he, how's his stroke now? I mean, just for the sake of some of our, our viewers uh, and listeners, yeah, how, how is things in, in that front? Yeah, so he recovered to the point of being able to support himself walking uh, until about five years ago uh, where he got epilepsy. So it wasn't another stroke of epilepsy where he got bedridden again. So we're very thankful and grateful uh, that he's been recovering, especially this past year. He should be able to walk soon. So going from full recovery to going to bedridden and almost losing him to be able to walk again very soon. Right? So we feel very blessed to, to have him despite all of the challenges along the way. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really good news to hear about that. Um, yeah. And, and again, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm thankful to hear your optimism. It's, it's a breath of fresh air uh, in this time uh, where everybody is so uh, pessimistic. Everybody's so just down with the sheer, well, if, if you're not getting a pay cut, it's just, just the sheer amount of work. Uh, it's, it's getting us down. Um, all right. Uh, I've probably got the last uh, question for, for today. Um, uh, you know, you talked a lot about how you, you implement your plans. Um, how do you go about, you, you know, in this season, uh, planning for the future? Uh, yeah, and, and we are in the midst of uncertainty. Uh, we, uh, we don't know what's going to happen next. You also brought up the, the point where uh, we could potentially get um, uh, a second or third wave, you know, things like that. How, how do you go about planning uh, in, in terms of, of all these things? Yeah, so, I mean, there's no three-year plan, five-year plan to get out of this. That's what we used to have pre-crisis, right? Now, none of that really matters. Whatever it was, your three-year plan is scratched because you're not, you have no control of what's happening moving forward. It's all about focusing on the immediate, right? Getting through the next month and mitigating whatever risks you have in operations, right? So what we've been planning is month to month. We do have visibility over the next one to two years, right? right? But we know that anything can happen. And we need to really focus on making sure that any given time we strengthen the fundamentals. So most of we look at the key numbers, which is cash on hand. We need to make sure that if things go further south, right? If it ever did, we have learned the lesson of keeping enough cash to actually sustain payroll even without income. So things are like having reserves to 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 sufficiently to tide you over this kind of difficult time. So those are the key metrics that are 
that uh, our team's actually looking at and just bolstering up month to month until we have some clear line where we're over this whole COVID-19 thing, right? right we're hopefully when there's a vaccine, right? And we can move forward uh, confidently. That's when we can actually plan multiple years ahead. I and mean, that's right. our take on it. So, I mean, in, in terms of this, uh, yeah. So when you talk about, uh, uh, yeah, sustaining your, your business, uh, do you have like a measure? Like, uh, you know, I, I'm able to sustain three months, six months. Uh, yeah, how, how do you measure that, that part of the, the thing? Yeah, so it's about your basic, your total monthly burn, right? From your operating costs and for actually financing the business versus cash on hand. So we've been extending that. So we had, I think like, we went from eight months, we're targeting now, we're at 12, we're target, take, trying to take it at 24. And that's our active wow. uh, target that we're doing that. That's the benchmark when you're past 12, that's when you feel a bit more comfortable. Again, you never know. It's just a false sense of security that you have, but we just want that <laughs> for this time being. But that's something impressive. Um, so basically what's been happening uh, is that business is becoming uh, so good that it's essentially able to sustain itself, right? Uh, and and uh, from eight months to 12 months and, and you're pushing it further, right? So, mm -hmm. so that's, that's really something uh, impressive. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm quite impressed by that as well. Uh, yeah, I, I think you guys can give Aaron a thumbs up because uh, it's, it's quite phenomenal even in, in this time. Um, wow, we've got somebody who dropped uh, a bunch of questions um, uh, all at the same time. Uh, so... So we're going to just go through them. Uh, if you don't mind, just probably rapid fire with, with down at the last uh, 10 minutes uh, or, or less. Um, so if you can just rapid fire some of these questions. Um, so how, how do you accurately measure uh, savings in terms of uh, carbon and carbon emissions and, and uh, reduction? Yeah, how, how is that? Um, uh, how, do you, how do you measure that? So everything is black and white. Everything can be metered. Just for example, like your TNB meter that measures how much electricity is going in, we baseline an existing system with meters to see how much energy per unit of cooling, heating or something that they use. And that same meter stays in when you retrofit. So it's very clear, uh, black and white, where what you are doing, what you're, doing, what you're gonna receive with our system, have we achieved it, right? So there's no gray area. Everything is metered with something that is called billing grade, meaning the same grade that TNB would trust you build it. I know some people don't trust billing grade at this moment. It's a sensitive topic, but I mean, that's the international standard billing grades. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. The billing grade. Uh, so, and you've, you've got this device and you've got this, this meter and it's, it's approved by, by TNB. It's, it's, uh, yeah, you can buy yeah. it. You can buy it. So even if you're, you're skeptic about TNB's meter, there's nothing stopping you buying your own meter to verify <laughs> TNB's meter. Right? It's openly available. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, so the next thing is, um, maybe in, in this area of uh, sustainability and, and uh, uh, carbon, uh, uh, carbon reduction, uh, who are I Handal's uh, competitors? Uh, I mean, it, it's, it's a very direct way of, of saying that, uh, but who are some of I Handal's, uh, you know, uh, if not competitors, uh, peers, uh, yeah, some people in the same industry that, that work uh, in, in, with the same uh, ends, lah, you know? So because we do turnkey, there's very few competitors that do end-to-end, -end, right? In terms of technology is proprietary. But in terms of business model, what we envision ourselves as our competitor, right? one day we want to be benchmarked against, is a company called NG in France. It's uh, like our TNB here, but it's the utility company of France, right? Uh, it's a private company across Europe where they have actually gone into uh, financing and doing projects on a global scale for energy efficiency, right? And they partner with, so they basically a platform that connects businesses to solutions providers. So instead of just coming with your own tech, we actually can do it on a much bigger platform, which is what we're looking towards. Right? But then for their companies in several billions of euros in annual revenue. So we, we, we see that as our northern light in terms of who we're trying to fight against. No, it's, it's good that you brought up uh, yeah, the, the, France, the France TNB, essentially, right? Um, uh, relating to that, how has uh, our government or, or even TNB uh, supported your company in the past uh, or are they even supporting now? Uh, are, you, are you thinking of doing some kind of collaboration with them uh, yeah, in, in, in that ter terms? Because I mean, if, if um, uh, NG, right? NG in, in France is, is uh, uh, a service provider for, for energy, energy service provider, and you are, you are a, a company that helps them save as well. Uh, so 
would you ever think about collaboration? That's one. Uh, but has the government uh, uh, ever supported you before? Yeah. So the TMB question, it's, uh, it's a sensitive one. But uh, anyway, NG is a private company. That's a bit different. So they are free to do any business they want. Whereas our, our, our TNB is not really uh, private, right? It's still government linked. So they're limited to certain business units that are actually controlled by the government as well, right? You have a company, right? It's subsidized and it's something that's core to the nation's interest. It's not privatized. So they're limited to what they can do, right? We're open to collaboration. We have worked with them in the past, but there's nothing against them because we don't tamper with the meter. We don't play with the meter. We're just applying something that's more efficient, just like you changing on a light bulb to something that's more efficient, just ours on a much bigger scale, right? So there's never been any beef with TNB, anything like that, right? We're not a competitor. We're not taking revenue away from them. Um, so in terms of the government, they have been very helpful to the green industry in general, just not as much as to renewable energy. So there's incentives like income tax incentives for our clients. Uh, when they do actually do a project with us, they get some income tax incentives uh, to deduct whatever they've paid us against income tax. Uh, there's some grants here and there, but it's not, of course, it's never as much as other industries get. Right? Like, you know, there's no tax holiday for 10 years or kind of thing until recently, uh, for one, two years, they've, they've come up with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thanks, thanks for that, uh, Aaron. Wow. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, uh, tricky ground to, to put you on, but, but thanks for that answer. I think it's, it's very uh, helpful. Um, so maybe just some of your thoughts, uh, Aaron. Uh, what can be done or what are some of the things that you hope to see in, in our uh, ASEAN region uh, in order to make this whole region more sustainable? What, what are some of the things that we, uh, we should see that are, are, are put in place yeah, for that to happen? I think ASEAN, they've been collaborating. You know, they always have ASEAN where the governments try to work together. So in terms of sustainability, they have uh, attempted to do things where they wanted engineering companies to be able to work cross-border and they're trying to do those kind of things. So they want to receive more cooperation where companies can work easily, right? Share certifications cross-borders. That's something that's already happening. Just want to make sure that it actually follows through. And by doing that means that a company in Malaysia can actually go and supply a company in Malaysia with our licenses, you know, something like that. Right, so that actually encourage us to be treated as a region. It's like an EU, right, where it's a block where we can help each other versus every company, every country just fighting for themselves. It's something we can bring in as a common fight and actually share technology and resources together. All right, yeah, thanks, thanks for that. Yeah, looking forward to to some more collaboration. Uh, yeah, I'm surprised you brought uh, brought up as uh, ASEAN to. Uh, uh, and to compare it with EU, yeah, to, to support each other within our country and not just looking uh, for our own interests. Yeah, it's, it's something that uh, I think we all need to learn individually, uh, but as well as, as countries. Yeah, uh, we're just running, uh, about running out of time. Um, so Aaron, maybe you can just uh, give us uh, some closing remarks or anything you want to uh, leave with us for, for today. Uh... I just hope that what, whatever that we shared was a bit more insight about the industry. Maybe some people only knew when they talk about green tech is about solar. So I hope you have a wider understanding of it. And I hope that you actually move to find out more about how you yourself can be, take part in actually being a greener citizen in a sense and being part of this change, not leaving it just to certain individuals to create a better environment. So we do it collectively. We can actually really achieve a carbon neutral future and a better environment for future generations. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for that, Aaron. Uh, and with that, we, we would like to say a, a very big thank you. Uh, thanks, Aaron, for, for taking your time. Um, I know you're really busy in this season uh, with, with the increase in, in, in projects and uh, yeah, your, your company closing as well, uh, accounts closing, right? Um, and and uh, thanks, thanks for taking your time. So why don't we all give Aaron, uh, give him a, a virtual clap uh, or a real clap uh, and, and give him a thumbs up. Uh, and, and so that he can see uh, something, uh, drop something in the, the comment section as well to appreciate uh, his time with us. Um, yeah, and, and uh, well, if you've got any further questions, go ahead and drop it uh, yeah, in, the, in the chat as well. I'm sure he'll be glad to, to answer it as well. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, looking forward to see you again uh, some other time. Uh, thanks for taking your time again with us. See you again soon. Thanks All right. Uh, most welcome. Um, we would like to continue with our uh, uh, business talks even uh, next week. So next week, we're going to have another interesting speaker for all of us here. Uh, and he is uh, uh, Vernon Chua, and he is 
the founder and CEO of Energia Labs, and he'll be talking about driving digitization towards the data economy. All right, so uh, uh, Vernon is somebody who's quite interesting. He works in the retail sector. Uh, I know that uh, many of you who are in the retail sector have been badly affected by uh, COVID-19 and MCO and all that. Uh, but uh, uh, let's hear from Vernon how he has, he's, he's been using his uh, uh, data management and data an analytics uh, to, to, to do well even in this time of, of uh, MCO. So do sign in right now. Uh, the link is open so you can go ahead and, and drop your comments and uh, uh, thoughts uh, as well. Uh, sorry, you can sign in as well uh, at the link uh, and, and do book your spaces because uh, places are limited. Uh, so today is the first time we've gone on, on uh, Facebook Live. So next week, we will try, try and do that as well. So do uh, promote it to your friends and, and uh, yeah, relatives, your, your colleagues, you know, business contacts. Uh, but the thing is, when you, when you are live via Zoom, you get to, to uh, interact, you get to communicate, uh, you get to hear uh, uh, directly from the speaker, you get to drop your comments, uh, you know, so, so do join us live uh, via Zoom as well. All right. Um, also, if you'd like to get in touch with the team here at Workplace at the River, uh, yeah, there's a team of us that, that work together and we want to empower the workplace. We want to empower you. Uh, so we're looking towards collaboration. We're looking towards uh, helping each other uh, through the workplace. We want to help you thrive, even in this time of uh, COVID-19 uh, and post-MCO, as, as you know, uh, many of us try and pick up the pieces about what's been happening. Uh, do drop your contacts uh, at uh, tiny.cc slash water connect. Uh, yeah, I believe yeah, the slide is up. So drop your contacts there. Uh, give us, give us some, some information and uh, we'll keep it to ourselves. Uh, but we would like to uh, encourage collaboration. So uh, yeah, do drop your, your, your details. It's kind of like dropping your business card at the end of a networking session. All right, so looking forward to hear from you there. All right, we have come to the end of uh, this evening. Thank you all for joining us uh, at, at Workplace at the River at our Biz Talk. My name is Joel and I'm part of the team and it's been my pleasure to host you this evening. See you again next week. Bye-bye.